Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Williams from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. I'm delighted to be here. I uh, represent the complex trait community, and uh, my, I've been sort of assigned the task of, of uh, discussing modifiers. I'm going to do it in a particular context of experimental precision medicine, which is our pivot of what used to be called complex trait analysis or QTL mapping. We're trying to, to make this a little bit more relevant to current efforts in uh, precision healthcare and human uh, clinical cohorts. And I think you'll see that we now have uh, the resources that make this much more doable. The other theme of my talk is going to be the fact that we actually have two uh, animal, animal model communities. We have those of you who use uh, mainly reverse genetic methods and those of us who use mainly forward genetics methods. And uh, that dichotomy was valid perhaps 10 years ago, but I think it's really dissolving right now so that anybody that's uh, doing forward genetics ultimately uses comp resources uh, or CRISPR-Cas9 to confirm mechanism, confirm allele. And I think it's also true that those of you that are looking at knockout effects are more and more acutely aware of the role of genetic background. So those worlds are coming together. I think they need to come together because as is probably obvious to everybody in the room. Uh, this community, our communities, are under a lot of stress, uh, largely in part of the wonderful success of genome-wide association studies. It's been marvelous, uh, but it has made some of what we do a little less germane than it might have been 10 or 15 years ago when it was not clear that um, GWAS was going to be so incredibly effective in admittedly getting small effect genes out, but, but still, it's a big progress. Um, this is the sort of theme. I can remember Eric Lander gave this talk in Memphis in 1994 with these slides from the American Express ad campaign. Uh, it's still very germane. The joke in this slide is that's only a 1.44 difference between Wilt and Willie. Uh, this is the kind of pervasive genetic variation which drives most of uh, clinical health care concerns. Um, I have added my version of Wilton Willie there, the two little mice on the bottom. Those are two members of a, of a family that differ for about six million sequence variants. So I'd argue they're about as genetically variable as Wilton Willie are. Um, the other community. <laughs> I, I have a version of this where somebody sketched in my face on that. Um, but this is, this is something that hasn't been broached today, and that is the uh, precision health care. We touched about it a little bit in the context of genomic medicine and where that's going. Uh, we, it's somewhat pretentiously caused, called precision medicine. It probably should be called probabilistic health care. We don't really have a good idea yet of how accurate our, our probabilities will be. Uh, but I think we'll get there. And, and what I want to propose to you today is some solutions that will give us our, those ROC uh, curves that we really need to understand prediction for um, this very politically incorrect group of human beings. I want you to notice there's only one old white guy in this, on this, uh, it's really, it's, it's terrible. But um, so the problem with humans obviously is they're ends of one and uh, that makes prediction extremely difficult. And so the question is, how can we bootstrap from the resources we have for rodent models to actually enable that kind of uh, bodacious uh, prediction from N of 1? I, I think these are a couple of studies that, have, that, have, that are leading the way in human genetics. Mike Snyder has been torturing himself by generating his own phenome. He is probably the most deeply phenotyped uh, individual human right now from the 2012 paper in Cell. Um, the group at Vanderbilt has been using phenome-wide association studies using the Vanderbilt BioView database. We're obviously now doing this with Geisinger and many other databases. UK Biobank can now be flipped on its head and used for phenome-wide association studies. This is after 10 years where Mike is, really. So we're now up to a total of about 109 individuals who have been repeatedly profiled over three years for pre-diabetic risk uh, using serial transcriptomes, uh, biochemistry, et cetera. When you actually, it's very common for, for all of us in the room to complain about the enormous amount of data we have for phenotypes and genomes. We actually have pathetically little phenome data. This is it. This is the best paper I can find on deep human phenotyping, and it's frankly 
just two years, three years worth for 109 individuals. So when it comes to building these sophisticated models that we'd like to strap together with AI systems, uh, we're not doing very well, frankly. And uh, we have to do a lot better. There are hardcore limitations to what you can do with N of one human beings. Fortunately for us, there aren't with mice, rats, the elegans, Drosophila, and yeast. So we can proof this longitudinal big data approach to precision medicine using animal models of various sorts. And that's what we've been doing. I don't think I have to belabor um, GWAS. Um, it, you know, they're, they're, everybody has their own opinion. I myself think it's uh, incredibly valuable. I think it has maybe not been as actionable as we want, but that's because we're at the very start here. Uh, we're about 10 years into GWAS. So the real question is, how do we build animal models that reflect the complexity of humans uh, so that we can test drive predictive models? And uh, again, I, this, this gets pivoted every once in a while to, to make sure that the community, frankly, gets adequate support uh, from NIH and NSF and, and uh, European agencies, et cetera. Uh, at one point, and still is known as systems genetics, basically a many-to-many-to-many, -many -many, where you have many gene variants, uh, many, many interactions among gene variants and many environmental factors, social factors, uh, just the realization that life is complex and uh, we can't dodge, clinicians can't dodge the bullets. Those of us studying animal models can often dodge that bullet. Um, we'd like to get into the phenotypes uh, deeply. We'd like to get the end of phenotypes. And again, that's gonna be uh, difficult with, with human models. I wanna introduce the idea, really is reintroduce the idea of replicable isogenic panels. Uh, I know Gary Churchill was here last year talking about the diversity outbred. I am not a great proponent of that except as an expedient today. The reason is it's not a replicable resource. So every one of those DO animals, like every one of us, is genetically unique, so we can't accumulate the vast phenome like you guys have done for COMPT, for one strain of mouse. That's an incredible resource to have it all basically integratable data because you've used a common uh, genome. Uh, so the replicable is really critical. The isogenic is really critical. Um, one of the problems is they have always been inbred, and I'll show you a solution to that. They needn't be inbred. There's a great solution, which is an old quantitative genetic cr uh, cross type called a dial cross. It has nothing to do with alleles, by the way. It means parallel and dial so just the opposite of parallel. Uh, so that's why it's missing that E. And we now have wonderful resources to do an absolutely massive virtual dial cross. We have, well, you'll see more, I'll, I'll show you. But again, the, the motherhood and apple pie integration that everybody and their mother has been talking about since about 2000, how do you actually deliver that? What do those little arrows on that, that slide represent? To me, they represent mutual information, correlation, and that requires a sample size that's reasonably large, preferably 50, 100, 1,000, 10,000. Um, the beauty of replicable isogenic populations is that you can study G by E, G by G, G by E by drug by developmental stage uh, because, again, every individual or every, I should say, genome type is replicable. And I'll show you some tools that we have. So I think these are sort of the key substrates that we need for experimental precision medicine over the next 10, 20, 100 years, whatever it takes. Uh, these are the cute little devils that I've been using. Uh, inherited them from Ben Taylor at the Jackson Laboratory when he retired in about 2000. Uh, he retired, there were about 35 of them. We now have 150 BXD strains. Um, the isogenicity is kind of obvious to this community. Uh, the fact that we have 150 strains that are derived from the mother that you use, C57 Black 6. The father is Dilute Brown Agouti, uh, DBA2J. Um, and they, this is a family that's segregating for as much as probably all, almost all of European ancestry. So again, there's six million variants banging around in this population with minor allele frequencies very close to 0.5. So it's uh, very well powered uh, and reasonably precise for four genetic uh, studies. But the key thing is we can build a massive phenome of the type we need to actually do prediction over the next 20 years. Um, Everything that we've done has been, ever since Zerhuni started nagging the community about being translationally relevant, uh, we've, tried, we've tried our damnedest to be translationally relevant. 
by not obsessing on the mouse allele. So if we get a, a, a candidate gene that we think is relevant, we just hop over to uh, human GWAS studies as quickly as we can to see whether we can confirm, refute, refine the locus using GWAS. So the first one over there on the, on the far left side is a study of blood pressure control in mice, then a, an analysis of a Finnish military cohort just to show which gene is likely to be the candidate in there. So we're actually using humans to fine map our mouse loci. Um, we collaborated with Josh Denny to do the first joint uh, mouse to human phenome-wide association study. Again, bring those two worlds together. Um, and in, in this case, uh, uh, the study on the bottom is one in which we are now uh, actually getting to clinical care in humans with glaucoma with a candidate gene that was initially mapped. And this is all happening, happened in, well, you can see the date there, 2017. And this is now in early uh, stage clinical trials for glaucoma. Uh, so the simple family pedigree, uh, mom, dad, you know, mom you know, dad is DBA2J. We have the same resources that we're building for rat because we don't think N of one mouse is gonna be good enough. Ideally you'd have mouse, rat, Drosophila, whatever you can afford. We just really have to get, we've finally gotten away from everything shall be male at 60 days, and now everything shall be male and female. Uh, maybe over the next couple of years, we'll, we'll be able to increase the ends for, for other. So mom and dad, we make uh, the F1s. The only thing I want to say about the F1s is just notice that they are isogenic but not inbred, and that's going to be critical in the next couple of slides because I'm going to show you that we can make a massive dial -L cross uh, that's a virtual cross and doesn't cost us anything to make it. All of the members are sequenced. So right now we're up to 150 of these BXD strains. It's not ideal in the sense that it doesn't incorporate the complexity of the collaborative cross. Collaborative cross is 10 times more complicated. It's more complicated than all of humanity crammed together. Uh, 50 million alleles here with minor allele frequencies above 0.1. So it's, um, it's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, and it's particularly a mouthful because only 50 of them really survived. Uh, the, the idea initially was to generate 1,600 of these, uh, but we reached too far and uh, took essentially the mouse equivalent of a gorilla orangutan <laughs> and mushed them all together and uh, bad things happened. We should have known, we should have uh, listened to evolutionary biologists at that point. But um, this goes back to 2001 when we got the collaborative cross started. Um, anyway, so what we have are resources that are sort of like Finland, maybe a little more diverse. What we'd like to do is reach down and actually cover all of humanity. Um, this is a problem I already just alluded to, the two animal model worlds that we have to bring together. Uh, nice review from uh, Johan Oryx's group showing how you can do that. Uh, the convergence of reductionist approaches and systems approaches. The conclusion for me is our community has to work with you guys. So right now it's sort of, again, parallel play. We have to come together. Um, if you want to be venal about it, just to defend our turf, to make sure we're relevant to NHGRI missions, all of the IC missions, I think we're losing that battle. I see it for sure in uh, in some of the institutes, uh, basically Josh Gordon doesn't, doesn't want to know much about mouse models anymore at all uh, for psychiatric disease. So I think we have to really come together and, and collaborate and make sure that the translational relevance of our models is not in question. And it is painfully in question now. Work with human geneticists. Uh, that's kind of obvious and um, a lot of us don't do that. There are not many people who straddle straddle multiple species, um, and we need to work on that a little harder. Okay, uh, rodent sequences. Titrating complexity, big problem. Some communities try to go for mechanism, and that's really what they live for. Uh, and so keeping it simple makes a lot of sense because you get nice crisp r results. But like Carolyn said, sometimes they don't generalize well. They're just not robust. If they're on black six, yes, maybe it's uh, very robust on black six, but as soon as you put it on a 129, will it still be robust? Uh, if you do it in a mouse, will it be robust enough to translate to a rat or Drosophila? So tri titrating the complexity is a big deal. Um, and what I'm going to show you is down there at the bottom, you'll see something that says dialogue cross. It's on the complex side. 
but is complex with replication. And that's the important distinction between a dialogue cross and the, and the diversity outbred. So the distinction here is, um, you'll see the diagonal there. The diagonal is if I breed black six to black six, one to one, I end up with a litter of black six. And if I breed DBA2J to DBA2J, I end up with a DBA2J two strain. So that's the inbred diagonal. That's where almost all of our biology has been accumulated over the last 20 years. The Phenome Project is all inbred strains. Everything I've done, frankly, with one, one or two exceptions, has been inbred strains. But inbred is not good, <laughs> frankly. Uh, what is good is isogenic, the ability to replicate. And if you go off diagonal there, you can make any one of 62,250 F1s in reciprocal pairs, so you can swap parent of origin effects. You can make as many of them as you want. They're virtual, they don't cost NIH a penny because all you need to do is keep 250 strains of mice happy at jacks. They're already there, they have way more than 250. So from 250 strains I can say, given the fact that you've sequenced all of these parents, I know exactly what the sequence is of every one of these F1 progeny. Down to the long variants, the mobile element polymorphisms, we've now just finished doing link read sequencing of 150 of the BXDs. We're doing the same thing with the rats. So any one of those off-diagonal animals has been deeply sequenced. The parents have been deeply phenotyped, and I'll show you that. Can you predict the outcome from that mouse, of that mouse? What is its phenotype? That's where we need to be. We can't just play around with mechanism for the next 100 years. We have to deliver clinical care efficiently. I would argue that your group is doing a really good job because you're working with relatively strong effect alleles. So I, I don't <laughs> begrudge you your successes. But when it comes to things like type 2 diabetes, cancer susceptibility modulated by non-somatic mutations, heart disease, it's, it's a big, ugly world out there. Um, neurodegeneration, big, ugly world. Those are the diseases that actually run up the bills. And we need to be able to predict susceptibility earlier so that we can reduce the bills uh, to focus on the health care rather than the medical care. So that's, in a nutshell, what the, what the dialogue cross or these uh, replicable isogenic is about. There's a problem here. So even when we dreamed up the collaborative cross in 2000, 2001, this idea of doing the dialogue cross was on the radar. Um, it didn't happen for many reasons, but uh, we have, 62,000 is a big number. We obviously can't afford to do that, but we need a training data set. So we have to acquire data along the diagonal, then acquire data off diagonal for training, and then we can do our testing with this very large ocean of off-diagonal space to work with. What we can't afford is to have everybody pick their own subset of the dial -out cross, my study, your study, because if they do that, then there's no conjugacy in the data. There's no way for it to mate and for one to compute correlations among uh, different data sets. And that's, that's, this is an issue that where we need sort of IMPC style rigor. We need somebody to, to basically beat <laughs> the community with a stick and say, do it this way, or maybe there's a big carrot that says, do it this way. Big carrot worked better, by the way. <laughs> um, DX gives you beautiful genetic architecture. So the, some of the things that are on the roadmap for the 2020, G by G by G by G, which we know we have to contend with, G by E, which we know we have to contend with, um, it's beautiful because you've got this iso isogenic population that's huge uh, with completely defined genome, and you can ask, if I put that animal on a high-fat diet, what will be its impact on longevity, on heart disease, et cetera? So um, just, uh, this is an old method. Dialogs have been around since about 1951. I think the first paper was by Jinx. Um, so the, the uh, statistics are all nicely worked out. Here's what they're great for. Um, I already mentioned some of the problems. The sociolo sociology collaboration is a huge problem. Uh, you guys don't have it because you've been molded together, and that's brilliant and it's critical. Our community is all over the damn place. We, you, know, we, you do this F2 and that F2 and this DO and that. So we really need to have the same kind of uh, organization, um, top down, frankly, uh, because I think we'll get a lot, a lot farther. 
Okay, so um, if you assume we have the data, which we don't, <laughs> but let's, let's assume we have data. I tend to do a lot of neuroscience, so here, here's my version of a slide we saw earlier today with lots of brains. Um, and we need to take data from those brains and weave them together and understand what's the risk of neurodegeneration when the animal gets to be 18 months of age. Uh, so we've built a tool called Gene Network 2. Um, I'm tempted to take you through this live just to show it to you, so let me do that. Uh, I think we still have a few more minutes. Oops. I hope that's big enough. Uh, this is the home for all of our data. And uh, we have not just mouse data, but we have all of GTEx in here. Uh, as of version, version five, we're, we're down a couple of versions, a lot on Alzheimer's. Um, so these are data sets where they're, they're ca called classic EQTL, expression quantitative trait locus studies that we've been able to fish out of the literature or been given by colleagues, including Eric Shant. Um, for mouse, we do the best. We have lots of mouse families. I've mentioned the BXD family. This is a family that would be part of a large dialogue cross, but not the only part. Collaborative cross would go in here. And if I now, you can see I was having fun during the last talk and actually put in OXR1. Uh, let's see if my karma is good. No, my karma is not good. Let me make sure my that I'm online. If I'm not online, uh, I try one more time here, and then I'll just do the, yeah, I'll just show you the screenshots. Um, anyway, so some of you can probably get on. I, I, in this case, I did a search for OXR1, a global search, OXR1 in here, and what that will do is generate a list If I didn't throw it away, um, this is one particular, one out of about 40 million vectors of data on, on traits in gene network. In this case, there are about 1,600 traits on ORXR1 in various populations, mouse, human, rat, Drosophila, uh, potato perhaps, uh, and the vector of data is down here. These are expression values. We have data for proteins, for, for metabolites, et cetera. Um, and you can then ask questions about what is the distribution. So there's the distribution of phenotypes. What is the range of variation? So in this case, the range of variation is relatively modest, about 1.4. Uh, you can get probability plots, box plots, violin plots. So it's just a good web service. It's more than just a database, it's the analytic framework on top of that, and it also includes real-time mapping uh, using methods that are just for the kinship uh, differences that we have to contend with in, in human GWAS studies. Here, here are all of the sets that were looked at for OrxR1. I mentioned that there are about 40 million traits that were examined, and in this case, we found 1,880, I'm sorry, 1818 traits that have something to do with OX, OXR1. So we can then ask questions about its genetic modulation. So these are the, this column that's labeled max LRS is actually the LOD score, divide by five and you get the LOD score. These are very strong linkages. These genes usually, variants in the gene control the gene itself. Uh, so it's a self-controlled SISI QTL and then you can look for downstream effects. So it's um, be fun to integrate it into Marvel uh, at some level. So let me just go back and play the last few slides. So I didn't show you all the phenome data, but um, I mentioned Mike Snyder as, as the best phenotyped human being. The BXDs right now are the best phenotyped population on, on, in, a, in the known universe. Um, it's still a pathetically small amount of data given the amount of data you could get. We have only a handful of proteomic databases for, for liver and fat. 
uh, we are getting beautiful proteomics. So that's one thing, Carolyn, you didn't mention. We need proteomic data. We, we need to get at the kind of cutting edge of the genome where, where it hits the biology more effectively. Uh, transcriptomes are great, but uh, I frankly, uh, we've been waiting for proteomics to mature, and it, it finally has. Uh, so we have terrific uh, phenome data, uh, cloning genes uh, using this, this method, in the same way that Francis Collins said that it was going from traditional to traditional back in 1990, whenever he said that. Uh, this is true now for QTL mapping. It's relatively trivial now to, to clone genes using four genetics. You know, our group has probably done 20 to, to 30 at this point. Um, we need the same thing for rats, and we're, we're doing this with a lot of support from NIDA. So NIDA has, spends about $200 million a year on rat analyses of drug abuse, and it basically evaporates after a couple of years because there's no way to integrate that data very effectively other than publications. Um, so we're trying to provide the uh, NIDA community with rat resources that allow integration using the same dialogue across. So just some concluding marks, remarks here. Uh, really, we have to bring the communities together to make a case for the relevance of animal model work. It's not a no-brainer anymore. I think we lived under the impression that it was. I certainly did in 2000, 2005. 2010, I was kind of going, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> uh, now, now in 2019, I'm definitely wondering. And what we've seen happen in, in Europe is a dangerous precedent, and we certainly don't want that to uh, spread across the Atlantic. Uh, we have to make the case that this is really relevant to humans. And I think if you were to ask clinicians, how are you going to predict the outcome for you, you, and you, at the age of four or five or six, uh, given deep omics data to your ultimate risk for disease, it's a it's little better than a crapshoot. Uh, but I think we can get there with animal models. Um, I haven't mentioned it, but the dialogue cross works great with comp resources because you can make an F1 between 250 genetically diverse animals and your favorite allele. So there, there's a very nice example uh, from Catherine Kazrowski's group at the Jackson Laboratory who crossed in the 5X FAD. Um, human alleles that were on black six into the BXDs did 20, 28 F1s between 5X FAD and the BXD one, BXDs and got just wonderful uh, spread of, of uh, disease susceptibility to those uh, five alleles from in presenel one and um, APP. Um, and just thanks to a lot of people, obviously, that helped. Um, a lot of funding over the years uh, from many agencies. NIGMS has been uh, very kind to support Gene Network, and NIDA has been great to support um, kind of the biology there. Thanks. Rob, have you um, reached out to um, have you reached out to either um, clinical people that have a lot of phenotyping, like, I don't know, Kaiser, um, or there's a bunch of other clinics that are now trying to really sort through some of that? Yeah, yeah we have, Anita. So um, I, I mentioned very briefly, I just kind of whizzed through it, that we worked with the, the, the Vanderbilt group, Josh Denny. Josh is, is one of the leaders of the All of Us program. Um, they, they have as good an EHR data system as you can't have for a large medical center. But <laughs> having said that, it's, it's a sorry business. It's basically ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes in a good structure, but you know, it's, it's not quantitative data with rare exceptions. When we tried to conciliate with the mouse work, it was like every one of our phenotypes by definition is quantitative, other than coat color. Um, so we have nothing but quantitative data, and they have nothing but, but ordinal or dichotomous data. So it's really hard to bring those worlds together. We did it, kind of, sort of. Um, they're all kind of. The beauty of the human data is has great resolution for the FIWAS. You know, you're down to 100, 100 KB, whereas mm -hmm. us guys working with mouse populations are, you know, plus or minus one megabase. So, so it does work, but it would be great to have rich human quantitative phenome data, uh, and it would be great to have richer mouse and rat phenome data. We basically don't have very little despite 
all of our chest beating about how great our data sets are. So um, I, I might have a, a lead for you, potentially. Um, so a human longevity, uh, Craig Venter's thing, uh, where he's trying to sequence a million people. Um, he does a very deep phenotyping Terrific. of at least rich people. Yeah, I'd love to talk so to you about So the rich that people, you know. Uh, you know, phenome is is um, actually ex extant. So we, we have that yeah. potentially. So yeah, we should talk about that. Yeah. Rob, great talk. Um, I think as I think a lot of folks in this room can, while we appreciate our approach uh, uh, using a single genetic background, we're also very aware of the fact that this the limitations of that, which is the lack of context. And so I was thinking, you kind of alluded to it at the end and how we can use diverse resources to model perhaps large effect size uh, conditions. You know, I was thinking about the types of recommendations you might have and that sort of where would one start? So imagine the scenario you're faced with recessive, likely loss of function, disease gene. Would you start with black six, hope for the best, and then maybe add in diversity? Because yeah, we made realized it harder by saying recessive. <laughs> right. right, exactly. So, yeah. so Huntington piece of cake, right? So, uh, and the five X fad, it's not formally a, a dominant, but but effectively, I mean, it's not a dominant at all on black six. It has lousy. You you probably know from Catherine's work. Right. Um, I, I don't really know how to address the issue of recessive. You know, the inelegant solution would be to make the F1 and then make F a small F2. But I, I, I don't like that because then you can't, you don't have the advantage of isogenicity. So my hope would be that a large number of, of quote, recessive effects really have an additive effect. That may not be true for the sorts of variants that you guys are looking at. Uh, but typically, if you're, if you're a GWAS person or you're a quantitative geneticist, it's just it, everything basically boils down to an additive effect. That's why the GWAS people, they never even talk about dominance, right? They don't even know how to compute it. Uh, so so um, my, my hope is that, it, that there would be a su sufficient additive signal that you could grab onto it. You might have to tweak your phenotype and you might have to dive into an endophenotype. So if you're studying schizophrenia, okay, maybe you have to study something like prepulse inhibition where you get an endophenotype. Mm -hmm. 